won a Peabody, Peabody Emmy and Canada Screaming Awards. He founded the Berlin based studio High Road Stories uh, with director Han K. Eisen uh, in 2018. And this studio specializes in high quality immersive experiences and imaginative films. And apart from that, he also teaches at the Film Akademie Baden Württemberg in Ludwigsburg and the Film University Babelsberg, Konrad Wolf. And today uh, he's presenting um, uh, a presentation of the title Process, Time and Place. Yeah. Oh, Process, Place and Time. It doesn't matter. <laughs> I probably got it wrong. But, uh, <laughs> and I'm super thrilled to be here. Maybe not in front of you guys. I, I, I was actually more enjoying watching rather than, than, than speaking. But uh, I really thank uh, all the powers that be that have brought us all together uh, here in this, this place. And maybe we'll spend some time together talking about process. It's a <laughs> Canadian bad habit of making bad jokes out of everything. Um, in any event, um, so in the course of, of putting this, this, this talk together, uh, I, uh, I, I thought about what could be most useful for me to, to talk about uh, in the context of the thing that I know best is stuff maybe that I've done, but to do it in a way that is, is useful for as many people as, as possible. And I started thinking about, I guess it's sort of a theme of, of the conference in a way, is, is, at least that's what we talked a bit about yesterday, was this idea of, of what, what changes who. You know, what, what does the process of actually doing stuff, how does that change, how does that change things? And quite often I, I think we think of how can we change the world. Then maybe I was thinking a little bit more universal because I think it all happens to us is how does the world change us? And how does our actually ob observing the world change us? And, and what are the processes involved in that? And what are some of the, uh, the outcomes? And so I, I think I'd do like a hyper-local thing, like talk about a little bit about my experience, and then maybe there is some sort of universality in that, or at least some things that you can either see in common or, or, uh, or, or push away, um, either which is, is a useful process. Uh, this photograph, actually, uh, I put in my slide deck a couple hours ago because Facebook, of all things, reminded me that nine years ago t today I was in, in Geneva. And this is outside of Geneva. This is the uh, CERN, the rooftops of the CERN laboratory. And, uh, and we were there, actually I was there for like a week doing a, a, some crazy kind of workshop where they had people like me and then designers and filmmakers and all sorts of different people. Uh, together with the physicists, a select group of physicists at, at, the, uh, at the establishment, and we were working on these, you know, the usual kind of brainstorming, uh, co-creative uh, projects that kind of multidisciplinary um, uh, exercises. What was kind of interesting for me, though, was, I mean, apart from the experience itself and seeing the Alps and getting actually a sense of, of time in places because throughout this whole sort of high tech, high tech kind of brutalist uh, environment, there's also the constant clanking of cow horns, you know, sort of <laughs> super ancient, ancient form of communication. The cows talking to you and to their, their, um, uh, their farmers. Um, but we also went on a, a, a se several tours, uh, one of which I didn't go on, which was to the uh, Hadron Large Collider, because at the time, the big news was the, um, the boson, the discovery of the boson p particle. And I'm still not really sure what that is, uh, along with uh, like a bunch of other things that I don't really know that much about. But um, this was actually inspired by David's uh, mention yesterday. I took this photograph. I didn't take this photograph, but I was there, actually. Mm -hmm. So this, this is the office of Tim Berners-Lee, who's actually British, uh, and, um, but in Switzerland. And the rest, of, everybody else had gone on the tour for the Large Hadron Collider, and I really wanted to go. 
and I missed, I missed it. And uh, so I was just walking around this, this spooky place, and there was this, um, this, uh, this strange sign there, and this, this, this very kind of institutional, 50s kind of institutional door that you could look in, and you could see this place where I think for me, this is kind of like the, uh, the source of it in a way. And, and it was kind of important in a strange, strange way to be there because a number of things clicked to me. This is in nine years ago, so whatever that means, uh, two, t 2011, I guess, or 2014, yeah, <laughs> it's correct. Um, so I sort of actually had some, some thoughts about what the web browser was in a strange sort of way. And, and this, this to me was kind of strange that I would be thinking this. A little bit of, of background, I'm, I, st I studied as a painter as a, at York University in sort of visual arts uh, uh, department. And, and I came to computers much later in, in my life after, year of, after years of de denial of their existence. I, I was in computer denial and then I started working at this company, Helios, and then we started working on projects like, like High Rise. And I think what, for me, was the big enabler for all this to happen was, was the web browser. And I think in a, in a certain way, that's kind of what brought us, is bringing us all together here, in a strange way, is the web browser. I'm showing you this presentation through a web browser, and uh, I think we do a lot of our storytelling through the web browser, whether we actually actively do it or we, we passively tell our stories or we receive our stories through this web browser. And what became sort of evident to me was that the web browser is actually this, this incredibly powerful and intricate, but simple at the same time, tool of, of collage. And that's where it's sort of all the things that I had learned in, in, in school and all the things that I was doing at the time with, without having realized it, that's what I was doing. And uh, until this moment, this kind of like uh, moment of clarity and saying, this is what, this is, this is what this, this piece of technology allows us to do. It's, it is, it is, uh, it's an enabler. It, it, is, it is something it, that is, makes what was actually a complicated, arcane, expensive form of creation puts this into the hands of, of anyone. And uh, I mean, for, for me, actually, I was joking, but quite serious about this as well, is, is this, 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 this laptop, battered old laptop, is actually where much of the stuff that I'm gonna show you was actually made. This, this I didn't make, this is, this, sorry. This is, of course, Joseph Cornell, untitled work from I think in the 50s, and uh, uh, an, a, a, an assemblage, a collage. And I think that this, to me, actually speaks a lot to the nature of what we do, or how we put things together through, to, through the process of, of using the web browser as, as, a, uh, as a compositing tool. And uh, for me, it's also a sort of realization that something like, um, uh, yeah. So, oh, well, this right here um, is, is for, for, all, for many of us right now, it's inscrutable, <laughs> inscrutable hieroglyphics. This, uh, but this is, this is a language. But I think it's more than a language. It's actually, for me, a, a, a paintbrush. And this is something we'll talk a little bit as we go through this talk quickly, but that um, using or learning how to do this is from the same thing I think is learning how to use a paintbrush or learning how to use a camera. And it performs much of the same sort of functions is that it makes colors. It says these are where colors go and it actually helps people like me or yourselves perform these acts of collage or composition uh, this computer, this, this little thing that's fallen out, oh, uh. ah, okay. <laughs> so, 
So, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Make it go. <laughs> Do I have to pull out them? It'll be come back to. Oh, yeah. Here we go. Okay, so that stuff that Kat was talking about, just showing. Uh, like the, the one million tower, a lot of that actually was, was made on, on this computer way back when. So, um, and then I, I show you actually something here. GitHub is kind of like social media for, for geeks. Uh, it's sort of like a, a place where actually where you, uh, how many people use Git here? Oh yeah, yeah. See, so it's it's like a place where where very high, highly technical projects or people can actually share content, and they can be shared with like normal people like like ourselves. And 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 as you can see, we, we can start to see like a sense of time, like twelve years ago, that I was asked by the NFB to and Mozilla to to archive what we had worked on as 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 part of the. Uh, uh, wrapping up that part of the project. So we see here it's a little time capsule of 12 years. And again, this starts getting me thinking as well. Um, the same, same way that I was thinking at this, the front of Tim Berners-Lee's office in this, this, uh, this strange, strange building is that, and again, I think we'll talk, I'll, I'll explain this, this better, but I'll throw the idea out through there is that I think there's, there's something about using the computer as like a tool of making, but then as a tool of consumption that ties the, uh, the creator, the person that's making the, uh, the work, to the person that consumes it, because you're actually in the same spot. When, when you're, in, you're actually have the same relationship between screen and, and person, as, as, as each other. So as much as, as, as I sit in front of a computer and code or, or, or do whatever creative technologists do, is that, that that's consumed in the same position by the, by the audience. And it's usually a one-on-one -on -one, um, relationship. And then we talked a little bit about that last night. We tried to, to, um, to broach that subject a bit. And this, this to me actually gets to this 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 idea of again the audience and who is the audience and and uh, this idea of of almost recursion you know that that there is a cycle between the act of creation and the act of of consumption and that it is something i think that that is that this realization changed changed the way that i look at the way things are made but they're also the way that that things are consumed so when, when we look at a, a work like this um, Grinnell piece right here, this is, this is more than just an image of images. This is also sort of a representation of, of something that was held in somebody's hand and some, the, something that spent time in, in consideration, spent time in putting together and that you standing in front of this this piece stand in the same place that that somebody 60 years ago stood and considered. And when you read about this person's studio, Cornell's studio, which was in his home, the basement of his his his, uh, his home where he lived with his mother, this is all his his kind of uh, his universe, his pieces, his code, his paintbrush was kind of spread out on this, these tables in front of him. So he would have these, these drawings, these star drawings. He would have these, um, these, these lithographs. He would have the boxes. And these would all be kind of assembled, much in the same way that we assemble things and look at things through, through a web browser. And I think that he went through possibly the same, the same process of realizing I'm in the same place that, that somebody else who sees this will be they'll be in my place. 
So this, this idea of reciprocity, or actually another term that came up uh, earlier the, yesterday was co um, uh, correspondence. So this idea of, of sort of communicating across place and time, which I thought to me was, uh, was useful. So um, what I'll do then, I'll go through some of, some of the, um, the projects in a, in a, uh, uh, a fairly quick, quick overview uh, and explain uh, uh, a bit of them. I, I bring up this one because uh, I think, Marty, you or somebody had brought, brought this up as, as something that uh, had, um, was a touchstone for them, Kipu Project. Kipu Project uh, was something that, that uh, m my, work, my company Helios worked on with a couple of the filmmakers, uh, Maria Kort and Rose Lerner, and a creative technologist. They were both from, uh, Latin, Maria's from Chile, Rose is from Peru. Um, they, um, they, they, they did this uh, many, many years of, of putting this project together. The idea of actually capturing testimonies of women, uh, indigenous women from the Antiplano, the high parts of, of, of Peru and Bolivia, who were um, mostly in Peru though, because this was the part of the uh, uh, president of, the, of Peru at the time, Alberto Fujimori, um, uh, instigated this, this uh, a eugenics program of, of uh, enforced sterilization uh, to uh, an entire group of people. And uh, thousands, thousands of people, women, were uh, forcibly sterilized, forcibly because actually many of them had no idea that this was happening to them. And this is something that they only gradually found out through the process of, of, uh, of people actually discovering, people like ourselves, or, or shining a light onto, uh, onto past practices. And, uh, and so Rose and Maria went through this process of collecting testimonies through, um, through uh, voicemail. So th they distributed uh, small mobile phones or phone numbers and said, phone this number to leave your testimony. And this forms the basis of, of, uh, of the narratives here. And so the idea too was that, that the phones were going to be part of, of this, uh, kind of like a web browser, a virtual web browser for, for the people of, of uh, for the protagonists, so the way they could, they could listen, or they, uh, nobody has, nobody has, you see, this is not a, not a place with the uh, high degree of, of internet access, um, but everybody has a phone, and everybody has a small mobile phone, and so um, people left. What's the name Jesus, sorry. Is it safe now? Okay. So, so the interesting thing about about the uh, the process of collect of their collecting the, the data or just like a kind of crude way of saying them, them, them listening to this, these testimonies, is that, um, and when we put this out in this, this kind of visualization of a, of a, uh, a representation of, of a, uh, I'll turn this down a little bit, of, a, of an ancient uh, pre-Columbian form of communication, their web browser, which was this, this device called the Kipu, knotted strings, and and we, we associated each 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 string of this 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 uh, this graphical representation with a different uh, testimony, and then in the course of the testimonies, putting this all together, we realized patterns emerged, and and that people actually spoke about um, things in a in a kind of order that was um, that was that that was that had similar more similarities and differences. So there was a description of what happened to them, a description of how they feel after, a description of how their lives changed, and and but then what they saw 
what they wanted actually to happen, to, to uh, what, what to them justice was. And so that these formed these kind of, for us, um, uh, a kind of visualization. Uh, for them, it's reality, but, um, but the idea that, that you could break these, these conversations down as a community that, 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 was, that was going on was uh, reflected in these, these patterns. And, uh, but I th thought of a project like this I think of it, this as, a, as, as also a lens, you know, a lens for us to look through and to see something else and to actually have our, our lives changed. And that, that by knowing this, by knowing something that we didn't know before, uh, our, lives, our lives actually are, are changed in some respect. And I think this is something that, that I've learned through the process of all these years working with projects like this is that uh, each project is is a learning experience more than anything. That that you go through this this uh, through this process that you know not so much about things at the beginning, and that you you learn and you come to some sort of more understanding or greater understanding by the end. And that to me is 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 an important part of I think of any any project that that I. I'd like to take on is is not knowing, not knowing what what it, what it is that we're actually looking for until we actually have have it in our hands, and then quite often those those uh, those learning outcomes are are um, emergent. Uh, the next project I'll show you. Oops, I'll stop this. Is a project we did with an American filmmaker from Alabama, of all places, uh, Andy Grace. Uh, uh, and much like Rose and Maria, filmmakers, um, and, um, and, and he, wanted to, he wanted to do uh, a sort of a documentation of, a, of an experience that he had in his life, which was the destruction of his, his neighborhood by a tornado uh, in, in 2012, I believe. It's that... Uh, a tornado touched down in Tuscaloosa and destroyed his neighborhood. He he hid out in the basement with his pregnant wife, and uh, and 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 everything was was changed for him. And what he wanted to do, um, which he found out through the process of putting the project together, was uh, a just sort of description not of the uh, not of the act of 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 catastrophe itself, but the effect, how, how his life was changed by that, that catastrophe. And, and that there was, in his mind, there's before the storm and there's after the storm. And what's, what he wanted to explore was that moment in, in point in time where he realized that mm, his life, his life, everything had changed. And th he said there's a split second, you know, just like a pew, like the, uh, the big, uh, the uh, the big boom, you know, when when one minute there's nothing and then the next second there's there's everything. And he said this is a quantifiable for him, a quantifiable moment that was inexpressible as a filmmaker through uh, through what he considered something that he was good at, uh, which was a filmmaker, but impossible for him to do as a linear linear documentary. So he chose this uh, this format, sort of the. Uh, um, I would say uh, nonlinear, but not maybe not linear in the in the form of temporal, but nonlinear in the form of collage, and the ability to pull all these these different elements together to form this 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 kind of collage that I was showing you earlier, and and what we have here is like me. You're vulnerable to the south. You will go to Google Maps to street view, and you'll click the tab that allows you to see things before the storm. You will look at the view from the end of your street and remember the trees. You will visit the ranch house two blocks away, where the elderly woman used to tend her garden every afternoon. You will go to the house where your friend and her husband survived by huddling in the basement as everything around them was lifted into the sky. 
And as you do this, you will breathe. So, part of the reason I, I, I sh the main reason, actually, I'll, I'll show you the end here. Um, but before I do that expl explanation of why I showed this particular piece, uh, was this, this is using a tool that was, it, it can only exist in, in a web browser, which is, well, at the time, was, was Google Street View. So this idea of, of seeing the window, window of your life through this, through this, through this device, but we're actually using, we, we film it. So we film him using Google's Street View, and then we turn this back into this, this interactive experience that is, is, uh, is part of, of uh, uh, a longer, a longer web-based documentary. But we do get this feeling now of, of Andy or somebody sitting behind, behind the keyboard and, and maneuvering themselves through, through their, their life, looking at their life through, um, through this, this, this strange window of, uh, of, uh, of a web browser. And, uh, and this, this is the end of uh, probably like a, a, a 20 minute, 20 minute exhibition, uh, uh, 20 minute ex, uh, story. Kids growing up, the loss of your parents, the accumulation of years. Every day we're separated from the way things were to the way things will be. And so, future disaster survivor, when you emerge from your hallway closet to everything rearranged, try and pay attention because you're moving from one life into the next. And couple more reasons why I show this and this will lead into the next piece is that um, what we haven't really talked about is the partners the partners uh, that we uh, the uns unsung partners of the uh, whole uh, creation process is this, who, 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 who shows these how do these things get seen so um, or why do these things get seen so this was a piece commissioned by um, um, by PBS but then also actually ending up on as a long form, uh, long form essay on the Washington Post, and the, the, sort of this idea that we had at the time, which was actually Cat talked a little bit about this, the uh, um, the role of of of, of a, an organization like the New York Times, or in this case the Washington Post or the Guardian, as being as being um, uh, enablers for for this kind of content, and. Uh, it was kind of important for us, and still I think is, that, that to consider who, who, not only who sees the piece, but how do they see it. And I think this also kind of touches on to something that we've kind of skirted around throughout the last couple of days, is the idea of, of where does the money come from? And why does the money come? And, and what can it do? Um, so this... this uh, and this also process too. I'm showing you this because this this is somebody. I mean, we made this for almost nothing, and it was something that took us years to do because it costed almost nothing. But it, it still got made, and it also was an equal equal collaboration. So I mean, we were really interested in the film language. Uh, we did, I didn't know that much about that. And Andy brought to the uh, to the to the. Uh, uh, to the project, to see all this, to, to see real film, for me was this, this beautiful treat. And then for him to say, oh, we're going to be interactive. And then, strangely enough, we, we became, we, uh, the creative technologist, me, became the, uh, uh, the quasi, the, 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 the newborn evangelical uh, cinema, cinematic uh, storyteller for that for this project and he became the creative technologist so we kind of crossed cross paths in a way and and but it was a surprisingly simple and 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 achievable and easy process there was nothing difficult about making this from a technical level and then once there was like this trust in each other for terms of co-creation this this actual storytelling or the uh, uh, the building of the piece was was easy and, and, and enjoyable, and something that made you want to uh, 
work on it every day. Another project, two minutes? Jeez, okay, I'm only halfway through, okay. But I'll go quickly. Uh, anyways, so this, um, this will be the final piece that I'm showing you now, um, a piece that we did, uh, we worked with, uh, or Dorit worked with us. Uh, Dorit Naiman is a uh, Israeli-Canadian filmmaker. She teaches in uh, Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. And uh, again, somebody who makes uh, linear, long-form, or short-form documentaries. And uh, uh, getting to the part of how do these things get funded, or who makes them, or what are they for. So this is part, this project, which is called Jerusalem, We Are Here. And I'll tell you a little bit more about the story after I tell you a little bit more about how it was made, was that this is a product of a, a research grant uh, that Canadian, uh, Canadian academics uh, in the humanities and social science uh, fields are eligible for. And uh, uh, she, uh, she received enough money to build this, this beautiful, again, project that took several years and, and uh, about a neighborhood in Jerusalem called Katamon that in 1948, all the, uh, the inhabitants, because they were um, uh, because they were Palestinian, were uh, were evicted by the, uh, the the new country of of Israel, and it came to she's somebody who was born in and grew up in Jerusalem. She had no idea this this community existed, till years later, she was looking at on the internet through her web browser, she sees a uh, a man, an old man. Uh, in Boston, and he's looking at he's looking at his computer, and he's got somebody with like a tablet, with uh, Skype of all things. He's got a boy running through the neighborhood that he grew up in, showing him, showing him the uh, his his old streets, uh, uh, his old building. This is where this is where his uncle lived, and he said, "Turn right, turn right, turn left," and and she got in contact with this guy since this is. You're talking about Jerusalem, aren't you? He said, yes, Kataman, I grew up there. I can't go back there anymore. I'll never be able to go back. None, none of the people that lived there in 1948 are able to go back. And so Dorit said um, this was an inspiration for her to, uh, to make a project with her research money to uh, allow people uh, from Kataman, the descendants, the people that were children there, this was a long time ago, to at least get a glimpse of, of uh, of their their old city and using the tools, the web browser, as 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 a uh, as a window. So to actually kind of duplicate what that young boy who was actually being paid by this old man in Boston to run around his old neighborhood with this 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 tablet showing him uh, showing him his 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 old neighborhood. But the important part here, and this is again about lenses. We'll just wait for this to... Oh, good. Um, so this, this was also a project about, because we use one form of maps that were available through a web browser, we use another form of maps which is available through a web browser, which is uh, Google Maps, which is another form of, of Google Street View. And mapping, mapping is, is this very kind of culturally and historically uh, loaded uh, loaded subject and quite often maps are can be boring but they can be also super fascinating and what we have here is this started off this is a a, a plan a a street view our own street view version of Katamon and these these houses that you see gray are things that actually um, we know nothing about and the reds actually are are things that we do actually have information about. And, uh, and the information is actually supplied a lot by, mostly by the, uh, the former inha inhabitants or the descendants of the former inhabitants or people that knew people in these buildings. Because that was actually Dorit's audience. So she took this on the road and said, I have this thing. It's, 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 uh, it's about Katamon and, and all through the states, all through the places where there are, are Ex expatriates, uh, diasporic Palestinians, that uh, they were invited to uh, to to um, to be a part of this this map making and to make it um, easy and interesting for them. 
was the, uh, the ability to put layers, like an archaeological, uh, like an archaeological uh, site, as it were. So all these th these different layers represent the the data that we that Dorit spent time researching and finding. So this this is we know what what uh, what Katman looked like in 1933, 1934, 1938. 1946, and this is where it got interesting because 2014 was, uh, was this this layer is actually something that we couldn't use uh, Google Street View because uh, the state of Israel doesn't allow a zoom level over Jerusalem beyond a certain point. Everyone else can go to 21. Is uh, Jerusalem it ends at at 11, and so this didn't give us enough detail to. Um, uh, uh, to, uh, to make a map like this, because this is also a, a state security issue. And so uh, we got a hold of, of uh, an organization that does uh, photography, uh, aerial photography using balloons and, and cheap cameras. So what well, just, just took a day, pretty much, of, of sending dozens of balloons up over Katamon and taking these photographs, and we got the raw photographs and turned them into these, uh, uh, these maps. And uh, I'm gonna leave it there, because it looks like uh, <laughs> time to go. But I was quickly going to show you, oh, just really quickly go through it, is, is kind of what I've, I've kind of do over the years now. I think it's, it's uh, it's a process that kind of is different than, than the digital process that I, uh, and very private in a way. Uh, m my, my own way of, of looking at the world and, and seeing what's in front of me and having that change me. And the sort of record of that is just uh, being in front of something like a, uh, uh, hang on a second. So this, this I started doing in, in school. So this is, this is me actually sort of like forgetting about uh, constructivism and, 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 and abstract expressionism and, and saying, well, this is, this is in front of me now. And I'd sort of think of this as a record, uh, a record of a time and a place, like every, every brush stroke is kind of a representation of, of, of time. So this is now 10 years later in another place, but still this, 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 this idea of this is the stuff from what's in front of you. And, and to me, actually, as abstract as, as like any abstract expressionist painting, because these aren't actually about, this is not an apple, this is not a crate of tea, this is, this is actually um, time. And uh, sitting in front, of, this is in Berlin. So uh, this, this is, this is, uh, Still an expression of time. This, but then it gets a bit confused because I think about reflections and, and stuff like this. But to me, it's still the same sort of process, the cyclical process of of um, being in front of something and and recording that. And same thing there. So this is not a, it, It's not really a still life. It's it's a, it's a time capsule. And I think of something. The other big. You know, there's Joseph Cornell, and then there's somebody like Giorgio Morandi, you know, who was like the inspiration for this. So I think of Tim Berners-Lee, Cornell, Morandi, and and I I think of these as kind of expressions of time and place and and things that have changed changed my my life. So there you go. Thank you.